Okay, alhamdulillah, you guys ready? All right. So alhamdulillah, um, after finishing our introduction to the sisters class, hopefully we understand the importance of seeking knowledge of the religion, not just for the men, but also from the women as well. Uh, we move on uh, in our discussion or in our series of the book of knowledge from Sahih al-Bukhari. They say that if you want to know or if you want to establish a relationship with a book, the best way to do that is to establish a relationship with the author of the book. And that includes our book as well, because we have a book that we are going to present in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Yawm al-Qiyamah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said on the day when we will bring forth a book for every individual And on the day when we will bring out a book and we will lay that book in front of him and we will say to him Read your book Today you are a proof against your own self So if you want to establish a relationship with your own book Establish a better relationship with yourself. The more self-aware you become, the more conscious of your behavior and your actions you become, the more you dictate with precision what you want the angels to write in your book. We decide, we dictate to the angels what they should write in our book, whether good or bad. So if you want to stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and your book to be open and only good things are written in your book, then that is what you have to dictate to the angels to write through your actions. But if you just messy and sloppy and, you know, you don't really care about what's written in your record, then you're going to live your life like that. Some people don't care what is written in their record. They get up, they gossip, they backbite, they talk about people, they engage in haram actions, not caring that there are two angels on your right, one on your right, one on your left, that is writing down everything you do, everything you say. Just messy. Then don't understand that you can get some of those things erased from your record by making toba, making hajj, certain acts that you can do that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will erase it. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, uh, follow up a bad deed with a good deed and it'll do what? Wipe it away. Follow up a bad deed with a good deed. You do a bad deed, the angels write it down in your record. Follow that bad deed up with a good deed and it'll wipe it away. So there are many ways that we can keep our record clean. But the point I'm making is that we want to establish a relationship with a book. Know the author. Same thing with the Quran. You want to establish a relationship with the Quran. Establish a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are many people who open up the Quran, open up the Mus'haf, and it doesn't really do much for them. And the reason why reading the Quran doesn't do much for you is because you don't know the author. You don't know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you're reading a book that you have no connection with the author of that book. But when you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the book makes so much more sense to you. You understand that when Allah is prohibiting you from something, he's not denying you the, the pleasures of the world. He wants, that's his way of wanting good for you. That when Allah commands you to do something, that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala testing your obedience to him. Because the more obedient of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's servants, the higher in rank they are. You, understand, you do understand that. The more obedient. So while we shame and blame and find fault and mock people who you know, try to be obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what we don't realize is that the more obedient the servant is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the higher in rank they are. With Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we want to, we are attempting to explore the, the book of marriage from Sahih al-Bukhari. And there are many people who have Sahih al-Bukhari in their living rooms, in their bedrooms, and you know, have read these, have read these hadith in these books, but they don't have a clue who the author is, who the compiler of this book actually is. So that is what we are going to attempt to do is to familiarize ourselves with the author of Sahih al-Bukhari so that we can have a better relationship with him and therefore have a better relationship with his book. Once you know the author, the book makes so much more sense to you. Imam al-Dhahabi, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, Al-Bukhari, Shaykh al-Islam wa Imam al-Huffaf. Imam al-Dhahabi, 
He said that Imam al-Bukhari is the Shaykh of Islam. He is the Shaykh of Islam. Wa Imam al-Hufad, and he is the Imam of all of the scholars of Hadith. Ibn Khuzayma, he said, ما تحت أديم السماء أعلم بالحديث من البخاري. He said, there is no human being under the heavens, meaning on this earth, that is more knowledgeable of the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu than Imam al-Bukhari. So who was, this This is the question, who was Imam al-Bukhari? His kunya was Abu Abdullah. Abu Abdullah. His name was Muhammad ibn Ismail. That's his name, Muhammad ibn Ismail. So when we say Bukhari, that's not his name. Bukhari is a reference to where he was from, which is called the area of Bukhara, which is in to modern day times, what is known as uh, Uzbekistan. So he would be considered Uzbeki from Uzbekistan, that area, all right? That was Bukhara during that time. But Bukhari was not his name. Bukhari is a reference to where he was born, where he was from. All right. Uh, but his name was Muhammad, Muhammad ibn Ismail. And he was born on the day of Jumu'ah. He was born on the day of Jumu'ah, uh, the 13th of the month of Shawwal. The month of Shawwal, which is the month right after the month of Ramadan. All right. The month of Shawwal, the 13th of Shawwal. On the day of Jumu'ah, in the year 194, 194 years after Hijrah. 194 years, meaning uh, meaning 183 years after the death of the Prophet So the scholars, they calculate things by after Hijrah. Right now, we are how many years after Hijrah? 1445, right? 1445 after Hijrah. So Imam al-Bukhari was born 194 after Hijrah. Imam Ahmed, rahimahullah ta'ala, Ahmed ibn, ibn Muhammad ibn Hanbal, rahimahullah ta'ala, another great scholar of hadith. Imam Ahmed was born 164 after Hijrah. So that means that Imam Ahmed was how many years older than Imam al-Bukhari? He was 30 years older than him. So at the time that Imam al-Bukhari was born, Imam Ahmed was 30 years old. And Imam, uh, Imam Ahmed was one of Imam al-Bukhari's shuyukh, that was one of his sheikhs, one of his scholars, who he learned hadith from. And Imam al-Bukhari's father, Ismail, he was also a scholar. A scholar. As Imam al-Bukhari narrates himself, he said, he said, my father used to listen, my father used to sit and listen and heard hadith from the great scholar Anas ibn Malik, uh, Malik ibn Anas, Imam Malik, one of the four Imams, right, who was in Mecca, all right, and he heard from Imam Malik, or was in Medina, he heard from, his father heard from Imam Malik, Imam Malik was from the Etba'a Tabi'in, the the second generation after the Prophet Sallallahu So that means Imam al-Bukhari's father was one of the contemporaries or lived during the time of Imam Malik and heard hadith from him. وَرَأَى Hamad ibn Zayd And my father also saw Hamad ibn Zayd, another great scholar of hadith. He said, وَصَافَهَا ibn Mubarak بِكِلْتَ يَدَيْهِ He said, and my father shook hands with Abdullah ibn Mubarak another great scholar of hadith. These names might not mean anything to you, but what I want you to do is, as you hear these names, I want you to write them down and I want you to go back and research them. I want you to go back to find out who these people are. Because if it was someone doing a podcast today and they start throwing names, you're gonna go back and Google this person and Google that. I went after the podcast was over and I went and I Googled this person and wow, I didn't know that this person was this. Imam al-Bukhari is dropping names of people that his father either saw, met, shook hands with. That means that these men were great men in the eyes of Imam al-Bukhari. These were their stars. Like in today's time, we run into people in the airport, we run into people in the mall, and we want to take pictures with them, and we want to post it on social media to show everybody, hey, look who I just saw, look who I was hanging out with, or look at who I ran into. Right, because these are people that mean so much to us in today's time. 
Imam Bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, my father heard hadith from Malik ibn Anas. He saw Hamad ibn Zayd and he shook hands with Abdullah ibn Mubarak, both of his hands. That meant a lot to Imam Bukhari for him to memorize this from his father. Even though Imam Bukhari's father died while Bukhari was still a young kid. Huh? Uh, he said that he met Malik ibn Anas. Imam Malik was one of the four Imams, of the four Madahib. Imam, uh, Imam Abu Hanifa, who was the eldest, then Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, and Imam Ahmed. He said, my father heard hadith from Malik ibn Anas, Imam Malik. That's just like in today's time and someone saying to you as your parent, um, my father met Malcolm X. My father shook hands with Malcolm X. Or my father, you know, learned from Malcolm X. Somebody that we consider a great figure in our time. That's exactly what Imam al-Bukhari is saying here. My father heard hadith from Malik ibn Imam Malik himself. And he saw Hamad ibn Zayd. He saw him. There were two Hamads. They're known as Hamadain. And one of them is Hamad ibn Zayd. Who was one of the great scholars of hadith. He said, Wasafaha ibn Mubarak. And my father shook hands with Abdullah ibn Mubarak. I did a lecture some time ago uh, on the life story or the biography of Abdullah ibn Mubarak uh, in Philly a long time ago. And went through some of you know the statements of scholars about him. He was just a great figure, man. SubhanAllah. Rahim. Inshallah, I'm going to do that lecture again. I'll be in the UK uh, at some time in June, and I'm scheduled to give a lecture uh, at uh, Masjid, one of the Masajid there, I, I'm forgetting it's on my schedule, but I will be doing the, the biography of Abdullah bin Mubarak again. But Bukhari is telling us that his father met all of these great men of Hadith, but I'm trying to highlight how Bukhari saw these great men the same way that we see celebrities in today's time. And I, and I wish that we didn't see celebrities in that light, but nonetheless, they have found a way to infuse, you know, celebrity, celebrityism in everything that we do. So, you know, everybody's a celebrity, even Muslim scholars in today's time, unfortunately. We celebritize everything. So what does that tell you about Imam al-Bukhari? That tells you that he came from a house of knowledge. His father was a scholar. His great-great-grandfather was an idol worshiper. And so his grandfather was the one who converted to Islam. Uh, Islam, Mughira, he converted to Islam. And then Imam al-Bukhari's father was Muslim. And then the lineage starts in Islam from the grandfather. But his great-great-grandfather was an idol worshiper. On Shirk. And then his grandfather, his father's father, converted to Islam, Mughira, converted to Islam, and then brought Islam into the family. So their, their lineage does not go back to Islam. Their lineage goes back to idolatry. And so he came from a house of knowledge. And children that are usually products of, you know, are usually products of their environment. Not all the time. There are some people who are great imams. We know imams that were great. There are great men that are still alive today that have done great things for the Muslim community and continue to do great things for their community. Unfortunately, their children did not follow in their footsteps. That's no fault on the imam. That's no fault. Uh, obviously, as fathers and mothers, we can always do better. There's always room for us to do better. Nonetheless, parents can only give what they have. Somebody who doesn't have something can't give you what they don't have. As I say to my children, I didn't give you everything. I gave you everything that I had to give you. I didn't deny you anything. If I had it, you had it. And if there was something that I didn't give you, that was because I didn't have it to give to you. Not because I withheld it. Not because I wanted to intentionally deny you. I just didn't have it to give you. Whether that was emotional support, whether that was love, it might have been a time when I was struggling myself and I just had enough to keep my own head above water and I didn't have enough to give to you. I mean, you can't blame me or fault me for that. That's part of being human. And wherever, you know, I was lacking, 
I was lacking for a reason because that those were the areas of your life that you needed to improve in. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is wise. The things that we are denied in childhood are the things are the, the exact areas that we need to improve on in our lives, ourselves, as we navigate our way through life. So it wasn't that we were denied. It was that those were the areas that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted you to improve in. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in surah number 7, ayah 58, surah ta'araf, he said, And the fertile land produces its fruits and vegetables by the permission of its Lord all the time. And the infertile land or the land that, you know, that the, 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 the soil is not fertile, it only produces sparsely. It only produces, you know, barely, scarcely, just a little bit, showing you that if the land is fertile, then it's going to produce. And if it's not fertile, then it's not going to produce. Meaning children are products of their environment. We are products of our environment. If you grow up in a healthy, happy, you know, healthy, happy, you know, environment, then usually that is going to produce healthy and happy children. Usually. But if you grow up in a dysfunctional, unhealthy, toxic environment, then that is usually going to produce unhealthy, toxic people. And so when you are seeking marriage with someone, always go back to the family unit. Always go back to how that, what type of environment that child, that person came out of. And while someone say, might say that, well, you know, I came out of a dysfunctional family, uh, but I started to do the work on myself. I went to therapy. I started to become more self-aware, more conscientious. You know, then that shows that they've, they've managed to make it out of that environment because they did the work. So you're looking for two things. You're looking for the environment, and if the environment was dysfunctional, was toxic, did they? what work have they done? What work have you done? But if you came out of a toxic environment and you didn't do any work, you headed for trouble. You are headed for trouble, I promise you. You are headed for trouble. But if the person has done the work, then alhamdulillah, you can respect that. Because they might not be fully cured, but they are aware. They are aware of their behaviors. They are aware of their triggers. They are aware of their actions. And I can, you can work with somebody who's aware. What you can't work with is someone who's going to pull a wool over your eyes, who's going to gaslight you, making you believe that the problem is all you and nothing wrong with them. That's what, that's what we do. we're not going to deal with that. That is toxic behavior. Muhammad ibn Ahmad ibn Fadl al-Bulkhi he said, Sami'tu Abi Yakulu, Dahabat Aina Muhammad bin Ismail fi Sigarihi, Faraat Walida Tahu fil Manami Ibrahim al Khalil alayhi salam. Muhammad ibn Ismail, uh, I mean, Muhammad ibn Ahmed ibn Fadl, he said that I heard my father narrate one time about Bukhari. He said, both of Bukhari's eyes, he went blind in both of his eyes as a kid. His father died when he was young, so he was actually an orphan. His mother raised him by himself. Some scholars say his father died two years, some say four years, but he hadn't reached the age of even discernment. He hadn't reached the age of seven yet, and his father had already passed away. And that resembles whose life? Whose life does that resemble? Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And it's something about a young boy that loses his father in childhood that prepares him, that prepares him for greatness later on in his life. Imam Ahmed was the same. Imam Ahmed's mother used to take him to the masjid and drop him off at Salat al Fajr and ask one of the men to bring him home after the Salat. His father passed away when he was young and look at the great scholar that he became. Imam Bukhari the same way. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the same way. It's something about snatching a boy's father from him at, you know, at a young age that preps him for greatness later on. And then there's some who wallow in their self-pity. Oh, what was me? I didn't have a father. I didn't have this type of lifestyle. I didn't have this. And they, you know, they choose a different path. But then there's some who use that as a catapult towards greatness. And we've seen that many times. 
He said that Muhammad ibn Ahmad ibn Fadl, he said, ذَهَبَتْ عَيْنَا Muhammad ibn Ismail fi sigharihi That the Muhammad ibn Ismail, meaning Bukhari, he went blind as a young kid. Lost his eyesight at a young, at a young age. فَرَأَتْ وَارِدَتُهُ إِبْرَاهِيمَ الْخَلِيلِ فِي مَنَامِهَا And his mother saw Prophet Ibrahim in a dream one night. His mother saw Prophet Ibrahim in a dream one night. And Ibrahim, Prophet Ibrahim السلام, said to his mother, Ya Hadihi, Qad Rabda Allahu ala, ibn, uh, ala ibnik basarahu li kathrati bukaiki aw li kathrati duaiki fa asbahna wa qad Rabda Allahu alayhi basarahu. That when she saw Prophet Ibrahim السلام, in a dream, Prophet Ibrahim said to Bukhari's mother that. Allah return the eyesight of your son to him because of your the abundance of sujood that you have made or the abundance of dua that you have made. When Imam Bukhari went blind, his mother said, Wallahi, I will never go to sleep again at night until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala returns my eyesight to me. I, until Allah returns my eyesight to, her, to my son. She made an oath. That I'm going to get up every single night for the rest of my life. And I don't care how long it takes. And I'm going to make dua to Allah every single night until he returns to my son his eyesight. That is determination. That is the type of determination that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will answer your dua. And even if he doesn't answer your dua, he doesn't answer your dua not because he doesn't hear you. But because he has something greater prepared for you later on. Brother Hassan Clay, I have to say this. He went with us to make Umrah just a couple weeks ago. And as you know, he's, he's blind. And he said to me before we left, he said, Wallahi Shadeed, I'm going to make dua at the Kaaba for the entire trip that we're there. He said, I'm coming home with my eyesight. I said, I love the energy. I love it. He said, I'm coming home with my eyesight. He said, when we board the plane to come back to America, I'm going to have my eyesight. I said, I love the energy, man. I love it. Alhamdulillah, we boarded the plane and we came back. And although Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not return his eyesight, number one, his life is not over yet. Doesn't mean that Allah is not going to return it. Number two, even if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't return his eyesight to him, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, there is no servant who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes his two beloved eyes from him. And he is patient with that, except that Allah will give him in exchange Jannah. He already has a guarantee of paradise. Guaranteed. All he has to do is make it to the end of his life, patient with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tested with. And he has already been guaranteed paradise. Who, who from amongst us has a guarantee of paradise? As of right now, none of us. As of right now, none of us, unless you had a miscarriage. If you had a miscarriage, the Prophet Sallallahu said that in the sakt, the miscarried child, la yajurru ummaha, will drag its mother into Jannah by the umbilical cord. So if you had a miscarriage, then you have a guarantee of Jannah. Because Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala knows the pain that is associated with losing a child in the womb. Losing a child in the womb. We're talking about you're carrying a stillborn child and you deliver that child or you push that child out or a procedure is done to remove that child and that child is deceased. For you is Jannah. That same child, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will put the soul back into the body of that child. That child will drag you by the umbilical cord into Jannah. La ilaha illallah. So there's pain associated with these tests that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us. But on the other side of that pain, there's greatness. On the other side of pain lies greatness. So as long as you are patient, as long as you are patient and you're willing to endure. What about the woman who used to have seizures? The black woman who used to clean the masjid. And she came to the Prophet and she said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, make dua to Allah that Allah remove this ailment from me. And the Prophet وسلم, he said that I can make dua and have Allah remove that from you. But if you're patient with it, then for you is Jannah. You want Jannah? You want a guarantee of Jannah? Just be patient with it until life is over. 
your days are numbered anyway. Just be patient with it until until your last day. And in, in exchange for what you endured, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will guarantee you Jannah. And she said, you know what? I'll take the offer. However, just make dua to Allah that when I have my episodes of seizures, that when I fall down on the ground, that Allah protects my aura from becoming exposed, that my dress doesn't lip up and, and expose you know, what is underneath. That's all I want. Just don't expose me. But I'll endure. And Abdullah bin Abbas, as he narrated the hadith, he said, we used to say she was a woman in Jannah walking on earth. She had a guarantee. She had a guarantee from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala returned. So Imam al-Bukhari's mother woke up, went in the room only to find that her son had his eyesight restored to him. And this is the blessing of having righteous parents who continue to make dua for their children. We can't control the trajectory or the direction of our children. Once we get them to a certain age and they begin to become accountable, they begin to you know, be responsible for their own actions. We can't, there's nothing we can do about that. The only power that we have as parents is to make dua for them. That's it. And perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will respond to that dua and at some point that child will find his or her way back to Islam. Maybe at 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, they're getting tattoos, they're getting piercings all over their bodies and tattoos on their bodies and trying, you know, marijuana, they're experimenting with drinking, they're experimenting with partying, they're experimenting with, you know, haram, you know, sexual engagements, they're experimenting. Shaitan is just feeding them because their brains are not fully developed, neither is their spirit. Spirit not fully developed. And Shaitan takes full advantage of them. But as a parent, you get up in the middle of the night, you get up at the last third of the night, you beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring your child back to Islam. And somewhere around 28, because that's usually around the time it starts to happen, around 28, 29, 30, they start to find their way back to Islam. They start to find their way back. And that's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answering your dua. It may not happen today, may not happen tomorrow, but keep getting up at the third of the night and supplicating for your children. As the Prophet said, There are three supplications that will always be responded to and there is no doubt about it. Number one, the dua of who? The dua of the traveling person. Dua al-musafir. The dua of the traveling person will always be answered. You get in your car, you get on a plane, you get on a train, wherever you're embarking on and begin making dua. Spend much of your tra time as you're traveling, making dua, understanding and fully believing that this is one of the supplications that will always be answered. The dua of the traveling person. Stop listening to music in your car while you're traveling. Stop, you know, pause and take advantage of the fact that you are traveling. And you are one of the three who, when you supplicate, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers. Number two, the dua of the madhloom, of the oppressed person. Dua and madhloom, you are oppressed in any situation, whether you're being financially oppressed, physically oppressed, mentally oppressed, psychologically being oppressed, whatever form the oppression is coming to you, you are being oppressed and an oppressed person is a person whose God-given right is being taken away from them without any right. The person doesn't have a right to take it away from you. You're being oppressed. If someone is taking a right away from you, but they're doing it justly, you're not being oppressed. You're deluded if you think that you're being oppressed. Oh, you're oppressing me. You're taking my right away from me because I have a right to take your right away from you. I have a right to take your right away from you. That's not oppression. That's doing what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave me the power and the ability to do. That's not oppression. Oppression is a right that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave me and someone takes that right away from me and they don't have the justification to do so. They don't have the justification to do so. Then you are being oppressed. And take advantage of the fact that you're being oppressed because you're in a unique situation, although painful, but you are privileged. Although painful, you are privileged 
take advantage of that opportunity and supplicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the last one is the dua al-walid li walidihi. The dua of the parent against the child. And in another narration, the dua of the parent for the child. Meaning, it's a, it's, a, it's a slippery slope because you might make dua against your child and not even realize it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may answer that dua as a test for you. As the hadith of Juraj, right? You guys recall the hadith of Juraj? When Juraj was praying, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa mentioned the story of a man from Bani Israel by the name of Juraj, who was a devout worshiper in his monastery, worshiping. His mother comes to him and calls to him, Ya Juraj, while Juraj is in prayer. And he says, Oh Allah, should I respond to my mother or keep praying? And he kept praying, ignored his mother. She came back a second day. Ya Juraj, calls him while he's in prayer. He says, Ya Rabbi, Ummi am salati. Oh my Lord, should I respond to my mother or continue praying? He ignored his mother, continued praying. She came back the third day. Ya Juraj called him. He said, Oh my Lord, should I respond to my mother? Or, you know, seems like she's always coming to me while I'm making salat. Should I respond to my mother or continue praying? He ignored his mother and continued praying. She walked away upset and angry. She said, Allahumma la tumithu hatta yandhura fi wuju al mumisat. Oh Allah, don't take my son's life until he looks into the faces of prostitutes. Until I break this, this streak, this spiritual streak that he has that is causing him to ignore and neglect his own mother. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answered her dua. Prostitute came. And she said to, you know, some of the guys that were standing around, they were talking about Juraj. She said, give me permission. Let me go test him. I'm sure that I can get him to break his streak. So she goes to Juraj and tries to seduce him. And Juraj ref refuses. However, she sleeps with the shepherd that is guarding the monastery. She sleeps with him and he gets her pregnant. Gets her pregnant. When she delivers the baby, she tells everybody in the village that the baby belongs to Juraj. Lies on him. They go to Juraj's monastery. They snatch him out of his place of worship, deeming him to be a hypocrite, destroying his place of worship. And they were getting ready to hang him. And they asked Juraj, do you have any final requests? Juraj said, yeah, just let me pray Turaka. That's it. The power of Turaka, man. Subhanallah. I came in, I was a little late. I said, let me get started. But then I'm like, nah, I have to pray my Turaqa Sunnah, man. I, I will never neglect that. I don't care how late I am. You can wait five minutes. But I'm not going to neglect the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because those Turaqa that I pray might be the Turaqa that saved me from the hellfire. Never underestimate where your success is going to come from. For you, it might just be Turaqa. But Abu Bakr al-Siddiq on his deathbed, he said, Ya laytani raka'atain makbulatain. I wish I knew out of all of the prayers that I had prayed in my life, I wish I knew that I had just two raka'ah that Allah accepted from me. So while for us, it's just two raka'ah, it's not no big deal. Abu Bakr was on his deathbed wishing that he knew for sure that he had just two raka'ah that Allah will accept from him. Never underestimate the power of two units of prayer. Very short, may seem insignificant, but it can be the very thing that changes your situation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Juraid says, Leave me, just let me, my last request, let me pray two raka. He prays two raka and he walks over to the baby and he pokes the baby in the stomach and he says, Men Abu who's your father? And the baby speaks as an infant, as a miracle, like Prophet Isa. He speaks as an infant and he said, my father is the, the shepherd so-and-so. SubhanAllah. Because the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, none spoke in the cradle except three. Isa, the son of Maryam, the, the companion of Juraj. And then he mentioned the third one. Does anybody know what the third one was? Huh? Right, so that's one narration uh, of Fir'aun. So I think that's where you were, uh, that's where you were angling. Uh, the hairdresser, uh, the baby, the hairdresser of uh, uh, Asia, her hairdresser, the baby. But some scholars say that that narration is, is, is moldor, is, is fabricated. It's, there's no asl, there's no foundation in the books of Sunnah that substantiate that story. But the third one was in that same hadith, 
when the Prophet ﷺ said none spoke in a cradle except three, the third is mentioning actually in that hadith. And that was the, the, the lady who was carrying a baby and a poor person, the rich person walked by and the woman says, I want my son to be rich like that person. And the baby stops breastfeeding and says, oh Allah, don't make me like that person. And then a poor person walks by and the mother says, oh Allah, don't ever make my child like that person. And the child is breastfeeding. Child takes his mouth off of the breast and says, oh Allah, make me like that person. That was the third person that spoke in the cradle. But the point that I'm making is the, the dua of the parent for the child or the dua of the parent against the child. So always be mindful, brothers and sisters, uh, of the dua that you're making or the phrases that you are uttering because you might actually end up making dua against your child without even realizing it. But the blessing of having a righteous parent, that Bukhari's mother, she knew that her child was destined for greatness or was pushing her child, her child towards greatness and felt like him having his eyesight was something that was imperative for him. And so she made a commitment that she would never sleep again at night until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answered her dua. This is what is called ilhah fi dua. is to be insistent in your dua and to be persistent in your dua. You want something from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the scholars say that if you want something from Allah, then be with Allah like a child is with the parent. You're going to sit, you're going to cry, kick, scream until the parent gives you what you want until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers your dua. Keep crying, keep begging, keep kicking. There's times when I'm asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for something and it's not being responded to immediately and I need it immediately. Every single time I go down into sujood, I tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, here I am again, oh my Lord, I'm asking you. I'm never going to stop asking you until you give me what I'm asking for. I'm never going to stop asking that is that fosters that intimate relationship between you and God. It's not, oh, I asked Allah for something. He didn't give it to me. Well, I guess it's not for me. No, perhaps you didn't really want it. Perhaps you didn't really want it. You're going to call on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala one time for it? Then it wasn't really important to you. That was important to her. She said, I am not going to go to sleep at night again until you answer my dua and return to my son his eyesight. If only we had mothers like the mother of Imam al-Bukhari. La ilaha illallah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala restoring the eyesight to Imam al-Bukhari as a kid, obviously this created in him, you know, humility and a closer relationship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because this was a miracle that happened to him as a kid. You don't forget things like that. And it alters and changes your relationship with how you interact with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so Muhammad ibn Ismail al-Bukhari, he began his journey to studying hadith at the age of 10 years old. Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala, when uh, Muhammad ibn Abi Hatim asked him, كَيْفَ كَانَ بَدْءُ أَمْرِكَ يَعْنِ فِي طَلَبِ الْعِلْمِ Muhammad ibn Abi Hatim asked him, how did you begin seeking knowledge? What's your story? And Imam al-Bukhari, he said, وَأَنَا فِي kutab عَشْرَ sinin." I finished the Qur'an memorization school at the age of 10. I was done memorizing the Qur'an at 10 years old. So you can see this starts early. This starts early. And for many of us as converts to Islam, we're, we're at a, a bit of a disadvantage because many of our children don't know Arabic. So it, be, it would behoove every single parent, whether you're a convert or you're second, third generation Muslim, born and raised Muslim, but Arabic is not your mother language, mother tongue. The first thing that we want to do is to learn how to read Arabic. And that is a very simple process. Wallahi is not that complicated. It is not. Learning the alphabet. Learning the vowels, the different vowel sounds, which are very simple, a, e, u. Fatha gives it the a sound. Bamma gives it the u sound. Kasra gives it the e sound. This is basic. Alif, ba, ta, jim, ha, kha, da, thou, sa, da, thou, ra, zay, sin, shin, sa, da, to the end of the vowel, to the end of the huruf al the Arabic alphabet. 25 letters. 
learn the, the, the beginning form of the letter, how it looks, and then begin putting the vowels on each. So with the Aleph, you put the Fetha on it, A. Put the Kesra on it, E. Put the Dhamma on it, U. Start with the Ba, B. That's the sound that it makes, B. Until you animate it by putting a vowel on it. Put a Fetha on it, it becomes Ba. Put a Dhamma on it, it becomes Bu. Put a Kesra on it, it becomes B. So if you put an Aleph with a Fetha on it, and a Ba with a Kesra on it, it becomes A, B. You're reading Arabic. It's literally that simple. I'm oversimplifying it, but I'm saying this to you as somebody who's not a Arabic was not my mother tongue. And I went through the process. I went through the process. I'm not telling you, I'm not speaking from a place of privilege. I'm speaking as someone who at some point in my life as a Muslim did not know a lick of Arabic. Nothing. I converted to Islam. My mother tongue is English. And I had to sit in a few classes and acquire the Arabic language like everybody else. Imam Bukhari ta'ala, was from Bukhara. They're not Arabs. He had to acquire the Arabic language. He didn't, he didn't know Arabic. He wasn't born an Arab. His great-great-great-great-grandfather was an idol worshiper. These are men who have defeat the odds while we continuously wallow in our self-pity. Oh, Arabic's too hard and I can't learn. And No, you're not applying yourself. You're not applying yourself. Let me tell you the best 35, uh, $36, $3,700 that you can spend. And I'm not just saying this for the Umrah trip that we sponsor, for any Umrah trip. Go make Umrah. Go to the Kaaba and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to teach you Arabic like he taught Adam the names of everything. Ya Allah, O oh Allah, Mu'allimu Adam, the one who taught Adam everything, the names of everything. Allah says in the Quran, Wa'allama Adam al Asma kullaha. Allah taught Adam the names of everything. Call on Allah, O oh Allah, the one who taught Adam the names of everything. Teach me the Arabic language. Don't let me die ignorant of the Arabic language. Don't let me die, leave this earth, and I don't know how to recite your book in the manner that you revealed it to your final messenger, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There are people from the nation of Islam who are not even Muslims who know how to read the Quran in Arabic. These are mushrikun. These people are idolaters. And many of them know how to read the Quran in Arabic. I'm, I'm saying that because I want to put salt on an open wound. These people are not even Muslim. Don't say, oh, they're getting closer to the Sunnah. Wallahi, I just heard a clip at one of their saviors, the, this recent Savior's Day lecture. And one of them said that uh, the Sunni Muslims wear beards because they follow Prophet Muhammad. And that's good for them. He said, the men from the nation of Islam, we are beardless. Because we follow Allah in the form of Master Farad Muhammad. La ilaha illallah. Don't ever, don't ever challenge me or talk to me about the nation of Islam being Muslims. There's nothing Muslim about them. They're about as Muslim as our grandmothers that are Christian, our grandfathers and sisters and brothers who are still a part of the Christian religion. They're about as Muslim as they are. You believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came down to the earth. I cringe even uttering these words, but I'm saying it for educational purposes. And any other circle, I wouldn't, I mean, even when I heard the clip, I cringed. To say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came down on earth in the form of Master Farad Muhammad is shirk. I don't care how many times they say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. I don't care how many times they quote the Quran. The Khawarij used to quote the Qur'an. The Prophet ﷺ said that they will emerge a group of people that the Qur'an will not go past their throats, meaning it will not enter into their hearts. It will only be on their tongues. They will read the Qur'an, but it will not go past their throats. They will exit the fold of Islam like an arrow exits its target. Don't be deceived 
Because somebody can quote some Quran to you. Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, إِذَا رَأَيْتُ رَجْلًا يُطِيرُ فِي السَّمَاءِ أَوْ يَمْشِي عَلَى الْمَاءِ لَا تُصَدِّقُهُ حَتَّى تُرُدَّ قَوْلَهُ إِلَىٰ كتاب الله وسنة رسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم إمام الشافعي رحمه الله تعالى محمد بن إدريس الشافعي he said that if you see a man flying in the sky or walking on water do not believe a word that comes out of his mouth until you weigh his word against the book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم I don't care if he's flying in the sky and walking on water weigh his word against the book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم because we are people, we get mesmerized with words and, you know, especially in today's time, people are magicians with their words. And subhanAllah. No, it doesn't work like that. But commit yourself to at least learning how to read the Quran in Arabic. You don't know how to speak Arabic. I didn't learn the Arabic. I didn't acquire the Arabic language to speak Arab with Arabs, to speak Arabic with Arabs. That's not what I learned the, the Qur'an for. I didn't learn Arabic for that reason. The sole purpose of me learning Arabic was so that I could better acquaint myself with the Qur'an and delve deeply into the books of the scholars. Speaking with the professors in the university, that was just a wasila min al wasail al ta'limiyya. That was just from the, the ways and the methods that we use to seek knowledge. It was just a vehicle to get me closer to the knowledge. But I'm not speaking Arabic and walking around, you know, used to have students of knowledge come back from Saudi Arabia and come back to America and every other word come out of their mouth is an Arabic phrase. And I used to be like, man, speak English, <laughs> speak English. Stop talking, stop saying Yani and Naam and, you know, stop, stop talking to me like that. Speak to me in English. Man. I, I don't, I'm not an Arab speaking person. <laughs> I speak Arabic by necessity. My mother tongue is English. Speak to me in English. Furthermore, many of them didn't even speak Arabic that well. Furthermore, you don't even speak Arabic that well. Just speak English, man. If you did not acquire the rules of language in English, then just as you are a poor speaker in English, you are a poor speaker in Arabic. It's the same rules. And Arabic is even more complex. So you listen to a person speak English and they can't give you a proper sentence in English. Their Arabic, I guarantee you, is the same way. Because they don't follow rules. They don't understand there's rules to language. Scholars didn't study language and, you know, and, and create poetry and all of these other systems, you know, to codify these systems to preserve the language for no reason, for people to just come along and acquire a little bit of it and off you go. No, it doesn't work like that. So Imam Bukhari, he said, uh, I came out of the Quran memorization school at the age of 10, meaning I memorized the entire Quran at the age of 10. So what year does that put us at? Let me see who's paying attention. If he memorized the whole Quran at 10 years old, what year are we in at this point? He was born what year? 194. Pay attention to the dates. Dates mean a lot. He was born 194. 10 years after 194 is what? 204. He memorized the Qur'an in the year 204. There was something else that happened in the year 204. Imam Shafi'i died in the year 204. That was the same year that Imam Shafi'i died in 204. And Imam Shafi'i died in Egypt. He died in Egypt. So, the, you know, just pay attention to the dates. You know, studying in the College of Hadith, it forced us to be, you know, more attentive to dates. Because those things are very important. When a person died, when a person was born. This is how you connect the dots. Because when you're staring at knowledge, it just looks like little pixels all over the place until you start connecting the dots. Oh, this happened over here because of that. And that happened that year. And that, oh, this happened that year. And that happened that same year. And this was going on during that time. And then until you have the full picture. Until you have the full picture. It's just like a little bit of pixels, just a bunch of pixels in front of you until you start connecting those dots. So he memorizes the Qur'an while he's 10 years old in the year 204 after Hijrah. 
and 204 is the same year that Imam Shafi'i died. Four years after that, in the year 208, was the same year that Imam Ahmed was put in prison and tortured for not saying that the Quran was created. That happened four years later, meaning Imam Bukhari was just a teenager, 14 years old, at the time that Imam Bukhari was being tortured. So here is a scholar that is budding, and here is a scholar has well into his years of scholarship and has now embarked upon this particular level where he is being tested, tortured, persecuted, put in prison because of holding fast to the aqidah, the proper belief system, and that is that the Qur'an is not created. The Qur'an is the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not created. Because if you say the Qur'an is created, then that ultimately leads you to say that the one who revealed the Qur'an is created. One leads to another, so you close off that door. So the scholars of Ahlul Sunnah, they say that our belief as it relates to the Qur'an is that the Qur'an is not created. It is the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in the year 208, Imam Ahmed was being tortured while Imam Bukhari was a teenager. He said, "Thumma kharajtu min al kutab ba'd al ashra, fajaltu atakhlaf ila al dakhiri wa ghairihi." He said, and then after I finished memorizing the Quran and I finished the Quran memorization school, he said, I begin sitting with a scholar by the name of Dakhiri. And I used to sit in his uh, circles where he would talk about hadith. So they used to have scholars that would sit around and they would quote hadith from their memory, quote hadith from the books that they got from their scholars who got from their scholars. You know, similar to what we're doing now as we get into his book. All right. When I got to Medina, there was a scholar, Sheikh Abdul Mursan al-Abad. All he does is teach hadith. He teaches all of the six books of hadith and then he repeats the classes all over again. Thousands and thousands and thousands of hadith. You go and sit in one of his lessons, you just sit there. He used to teach between Maghrib and Isha. From between, be, between Maghrib and Isha, he's running through the hadith. He's blind. He's blind, running through the hadith. And there's 500, 600 students sitting in front of him. And he's just running through the hadith. Hadith on Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said blah 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 and then he would finish the hadith, he would give a brief explanation and he would move on to the next hadith. You sit in his hadith between Maghrib and Isha, you don't cover at least 20, 30 hadith. Doing this every single night. That's his life. That's his life. I think it was only maybe one or two days out of the week he didn't do classes. But for the most part, that's where you go. You want to study hadith, you want to learn hadith, you go sit with the shaykh. He's going through book after book after book after book. And so Imam Bukhari said that after I memorized the Quran, I started sitting with a dakhiri and I would listen to the hadith that he was quoting. So he goes straight from memorizing the Quran to sitting in the circles of hadith. فَقَالَ يَوْمًا فِيمَا كَانَ يَقْرَأْ لِلنَّاسِ سُفْيَانَ عَنْ أَبِي زُبَيْرَ عَنْ إِبْرَاهِيمِ فَقُلْتُ إِنَّ أَبَا زُبَيْرَ لَمْ يَرْوِي عَنْ إِبْرَاهِيمِ فانتهرني فقلت له ارجع إلى الأصل فدخل فنظر ثم خرج فقال لي كيف هو يا غلام فقلت هو الزبير ابن عدي عن إبراهيم فأخذ القلم مني وأحكم كتابه وقال صدقت uh, He said so one day I'm at the lesson of a sheikh al-Dakhili I'm sitting in his lesson one day and he's narrating a hadith and the scholars, when they would narrate hadith, they didn't start with like the Sahabi, Abu Huraira narrated that the Prophet said. They would start with all the way from the chain of narration, starting from their sheikh. My sheikh narrated to me, that his sheikh narrated to him, that another sheikh narrated to him, that Abu Huraira narrated that the Prophet said. That's what's called an isnad, a chain of narration. That is how the scholar, that is part of the system that the scholars put in place to ensure that the statement of the Prophet Sallallahu is actually certified and official. Because if you say to me, the Prophet Sallallahu said, and I say, well, where'd you hear that from? Or what book did you get that out of? You're gonna say, oh, I read that in this book. I'm gonna go back to that book, and I'm gonna look at the hadith, and I'm gonna see if there's a chain of narration that that scholar can trace it all the way back to the Prophet Sallallahu They didn't just quote hadith like we quote today. We take the shorter route and we say that Abu Huraira narrated that the Prophet ﷺ said, and that's it. But these scholars would narrate the whole entire isnad, the chain of narration. 
And so Imam Bukhari said one day he's sitting in the lesson of this particular Sheikh and he says that Sufyan narrated on the authority of Abu Zubair who narrated on the authority of Ibrahim. And so Imam Bukhari hears a mistake. So he's 10, 11 years old. He's sitting in a gathering amongst grown men, 11 years old. So he raises his hand and he said, yeah, Sheikh, uh, you made a mistake. Abu Zubair never, never narrated on the authority uh, or never narrated to Is, uh, Ibrahim, on the authority of Ibrahim. So the Sheikh told him, be quiet, be quiet. You don't know what you're talking about. You're 11 years old. You're sitting amongst grown men. You know, I have, beard, I have hairs on my beard that is older than you. Be quiet. So Imam Bukhari insisted. He said, if you don't believe me, then go back to the origin." Go back to the book. He's narrating from his memory. Imam Bukhari tells him to go back to your book. Double check, cross-reference from your memory to what you wrote down in your book. And I guarantee you, you made a mistake. So after the lesson is over, the sheikh goes back into his house. He pulls out his book and he's comparing the, narr the narration that he mentioned to the crowd with what he has written in his book. And he realizes that Bukhari was right. So he comes back out to Bukhari and he says... Say it to me again. Say the chain of narration to me again. He said it's on the authority of Sufyan, on the authority of Az-Zubair, not Abu Zubair, Az-Zubair, on the authority of Ibrahim. And the Sheikh, he took the pen from him and he corrected it. He said, you know what? You're absolutely right. And he made a note in his own notebook stating that Bukhari was right and that the name that he mixed it up. He said Abu Zubair, but it was actually Az-Zubair. And it shows you, you know, how precise his memory was, He's, even as a young kid. Bukhari corrected him from his memory. He didn't have a book in front of him. Bukhari was the type of kid, he had a photographic memory. He could hear something one time and he would memorize it. Bukhari said on one occasion, I would hear a hadith. I would sit in a lesson in Iraq. I would be all the way in Iraq and I would hear a lecture and I would hear a hadith mentioned and I would memorize it. He said, and months would go by and I'll be in Egypt somewhere and then I'll grab a book and I'll just remember the hadith and I'll write it down. He held on to the narration for months, never wrote it down until he remembered and then he would write it down. Imam Shafi also had a photographic memory. Imam Shafi, he used to have to block one side of the page so that he didn't memorize the page like this, but memorize one page and then one page. Because if his eyes saw it, he wouldn't memorize it. These people have photographic memories. And of course, that is a mu'jizah. That is a, you know, a miracle from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everybody is not given that. But, you know, we have people in our day and time. Um, Sheikh Okasha. Are you guys familiar with Sheikh Okasha? Sheikh Okasha has a photographic memory to some degree. He can memorize, He's, he can, in his lecture, you'll hear him say, look in the Bible on this page, on this paragraph. I've seen him do it. He's memorized the Quran. Not just memorized the Quran, but memorize the, the different dialects in which the Quran can be memorized, which is 10 different dialects. You can listen to him recite the Quran in different dialects on YouTube. Go to his YouTube channel and listen to his, listen to his recitation. He's reciting the Qur'an, memorized the whole Qur'an in the normal way that we memorize it, Hafsan Asim, and then he memorizes it in other different modes of recitation where they change a Dhamma to a Kesra or Kesra to, it's so precise. But you have a memory, you can do that. And little did this Sheikh know that years later, this Innocence of Imam Bukhari would put him at odds with another great scholar during that time who was Muhammad ibn Yahya al Dhuhli. Um, and so he didn't reject the correction, he just thought that he was a kid and maybe he didn't know what he was talking about. But when he went back to his book and he looked, he realized, Oh, I made a mistake, and this kid was right. So they asked Imam Bukhari, Ibn Kam Kunta Hina Radata Alayhi, how old were you when this incident happened with you and this particular Shaykh and Bukhari? He said, Ibn Ihda Ashra Sana, I was only eleven years old when this happened. Eleven years old. He said, Falamma Ta'antu fi Sitta Ashra Sana, Kuntu Kal Hafithtu Kutu Bibini Mubarak wa Wakir wa Araftu Kalam Ha'ula. He said, But when I reached the age of sixteen years old, 
at the age of 16, I had memorized the books of hadith that belonged to Abdullah ibn Mubarak and Waqiyah ibn Jarrah. These were great scholars during that time. He had memorized their books. He said, and I learned the speech of these great scholars, meaning the speech of the scholars of hadith. He said, ثُمَّ خَرَجْتُ مَعَ أُمِّي وَأَخِي أَحْمَدْ إِلَى مَكَّةً فَلَمَّا حَجَجْتُ رَجَعْتُ رَجَعَ أَخِي بِهَا وَتَخَلَّفْتُ فِي طَلَبِ الْحَدِيثِ He said, and once I hit 16 and I memorized all of these books, he said, me, my mother, and my brother, Ahmed, we went to Mecca to perform Hajj. My mother took us to perform Hajj. 16 years old. Sisters, I want you to pay attention. She took her child to go make Hajj at 16 years old. Alhamdulillah, we had a couple of sisters that went with us to make Umrah and brought their children with them. Brought their children with them, Alhamdulillah. Don't ever underestimate the power of going to make Umrah or going to make Hajj, taking your children with you. If you have the money, bring your children with you. That experience is one that will be embedded in their minds and in their spirits. And hopefully, inshallah ta'ala, will propel, you know, you know, propel them to greatness later on because of that experience. Can you imagine a 16, 17-year-old child seeing the Kaaba with their own eyes for the first time? That does something to a child. And then, of course, when you return home, you pressing upon the child that, you know, after seeing the Kaaba and having this experience, you can't come home and be the same way as you were before. You have to change. So Bukhari said that at 16 years old, me, my mother, and my brother Ahmed, we went to Mecca to perform Hajj. He said, but after we performed Hajj, my mother and my brother went back home and I stayed in Mecca to seek knowledge of Hadith from the scholars that were in Mecca during that time. And so this mother left her child in Mecca to seek knowledge of the religion at 16 years old. What are we doing with our 16 year old boys? Coddling them. He's only 16. It's like, what? 16? He's a grown man at 16. We have to get out of this idea that our children are only grown when they hit 18. They're not grown when they're 18. Some of them still act like children at 18. Some of them are still immature at 18. But they're never going to mature if you keep coddling them. At some point, you have to... I was listening to an a interview this morning, or this afternoon, and uh, it was um, Tony Rock, Chris Rock's brother, and T.I. And the interviewer asked Tony Rock, at what point do you cut your, your child off? Meaning, like... I no longer do anything for you anymore. You on your own. He said, at what point do you cut your child off? And he said something very interesting. He didn't say age. He said an incident. He said, the first time your male child bucks at you, gets, get, gets bucked with you, then they have obviously begun looking for apartments because at that point, you've already solidified your adulthood. You buck at me as a child, you are making an adult decision in that moment. You've shown me that you are an adult and you're ready to be an adult. As a matter of fact, you're ready to be on your own. Pack your stuff and go. The, the first time we tolerate entirely too much. And this is why we are raising baby boys. We're raising grown men that still act like children. That's a fact. Because we coddle them. We let them get away with too much. There's no accountability. No accountability. We let them come out of their face, especially with the women, because, you know, this is your baby. And when the, the husband is getting ready to put hands on him, no, let him go, leave him. You know, it's like, how many times as a man am I going to allow this kid to be disrespectful in this house? And how many times are you going to stop me from doing what a man is supposed to do? You are, you are stopping progress as a woman. You're stopping progress. Because what is supposed to happen, he's supposed to get his behind kicked and then get kicked out and then figure, figure it out from there. Some people may not agree with me, but you keep those children home, they will never respect you. They will continue to take you for granted. They will continue to be entitled and they will take that mentality with them into whatever relationship they're going to go into. And you have nobody to blame for that poor woman or that poor man that is about to experience your child in real time. You have nobody to blame but yourself.
That's the monster you created. That's a fact. That's a monster you created. And with the divorce situation in our communities where the sisters, oh no, I'm keeping my kid and I'm not letting him go. And it's just like, all right, you reap what you sow. Because when that kid, he's, he's a sweet kid now at three, four, five years old, seven years old. When that kid hits 17, 18, 16, 17, 18, then you call in the dad, come get your son. It's like, yeah, but when I was trying to take him, but you have already corrupted him at this point. So even if I come and get him now and bring him in my home, he has already been prepped to be entitled. He has already been prepped to be disrespectful. How many times has he disrespected you as his mom in the home? And you let him get away with it. You get into an argument, you might curse him out, and that's the extent of it. It doesn't go any further than that until the next time. Then you want me to come get him and bring him to my home, and you think that I'm... No, I'm not tolerating that. You gotta be kidding me. You've already molded him into being the monster he's going to be. Now it's come get your child. No, when I tried to take him at seven and eight so I can mold him, you fought me. Tooth and nail to take him away from me. And we have to take responsibility for this. And I'm not saying all women. I'm not saying all situations. Don't. I'm not generalizing. I'm speaking about the specific situations that we are aware of. That these things, they do happen. Specifically in the African American Muslim community, because the, the high divorce rates and separation rates in our communities are probably astronomical and way more than what goes on in other communities. It's not because we're bad Muslims or we're bad people or we don't know how to act in relationships. It's just that we have a disadvantage. We have many disadvantages. From amongst them, we have broken communities, broken homes, broken societies. Everything that we come around, everything that we come from is shattered. How can we produce anything whole? How? When everything that we come from, everything that we are around, surrounded by, is shattered, broken into pieces. And you expect us to produce, what did I just say? That we are products of our environment. So it's not that we don't, we don't know how to get married, we don't know how to handle ourselves in relationships, we're just too immature, too underdeveloped. No, it's that we come from broken homes, broken communities, broken societies. This is where we come from. That's all we know. And when you come from that, how can, you, how can the expectation be that you produce something whole? Yeah, there's a few of us who slip through the cracks. There's a few of us who slip through the cracks. But I mean, like, there are many of us who still carry the burden of Jahiliyyah. We carry some of the burden, some of the demons that, and some of the skeletons in the closets from before we were even Muslim. And even though we converted to Islam and we made Tawbah, that still does not save our children from reaping what we sowed at that time. That's a fact. Yeah. I don't mean to quote Tupac, but he said, scared to drop a seed, hoping I ain't curse my babies. Because I've done so much dirt in my life. I'm scared to have children out of fear that my children are going to reap the consequences of my behavior. And it happens. It happens. Brothers who have converted to Islam, good Muslims. But your children never escape the consequences of your actions. It happens. Same thing with many sisters. It happens. It happens. And just because, and someone can say, well, you know, I converted to Islam and I made Tawbah, so why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala still test me with that? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just because he forgives you something, doesn't forgives you for something, doesn't mean he won't punish you with it. We reap the consequences of our actions. We can't say, well, I made Tawbah, I asked for forgiveness. That doesn't change. You know, the, the trajectory of the, the consequences. The consequences are still going to come. You are forgiven. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave Adam from eating from the tree, from disobeying him. But he still punished him by removing him from Jannah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can forgive you. But it doesn't mean that because he forgave you that he still you're not going to reap the consequences of your actions. You know? So as a mother, you have to stop coddling the male children, protecting them from making mistakes. That's another thing. We want to protect our children from making mistakes. 
It's one of the reasons why the elders in the Muslim community can't pass the baton to the younger Muslims because, you know, they're not mature enough. It's like, but when you first inherited the masjid or your position in the masjid, you wasn't mature enough either. How many mistakes have you made along the line? Now all of a sudden you can't pass the baton because they're not ready. You wasn't ready when you received the baton either. You figured it out. That's what it means. You figure it out. But when you are protecting your child from making mistakes, it only creates a perfectionist. And being a perfectionist is a character flaw that leads a person to being self-conscious about every single thing that they do. Anyone here a perfectionist? I'm one of them. Yep. Self-conscious about everything that you do because you had an overly critical parent. Could never do anything right. Sometimes I wanted to turn to my mom and say, do I do anything right? Anything? Like you literally criticize every single thing that I do. Do I do anything right? And being an overly critical parent. And that's not to say that you can't be, you can't criticize. But there are two types of criticism. There's constructive criticism and then there's deconstructive criticism. Constructive criticism is that you address the area that needs improvement, but you also highlight the good. So there's a balance. I like the way you do this, but I think you need to improve over here in this. You see how that works? There's a balance there. Deconstructive criticism only focuses on the area that you need to improve in and never looks at the things that you've done that are actually good. That's deconstructive criticism. So if you're criticizing someone and you only focus in on the bad, you're, you're destroying them. If you are giving constructive criticism, you lead with, you know, even with husband and wife. Honey, I love the way that you take care of the kids and you take care of the home. And I, I see, you know, I see you, you know. However, one thing I would like you to do more of if you could is when I come home to do this, you, you balanced it. You highlighted the area so that you didn't make the person walk away feeling like I never do anything right. You only ever highlight the wrong that I do. No, I've highlighted, the, I've acknowledged, and validated the good, but I've also highlighted the area that needs improvement. That's balance. That's balance. But deconstructive is you're just breaking the person down. The only thing that you ever highlight is the things that they don't do right. But being a perfectionist is a character flaw that leads to being self-conscious about everything that the person does. It is a trauma response that yields very little good, little good in the long run. So if you notice qualities in your child that they are inclining towards Islam, you put on Islamic videos, you put on Islamic cartoons, and you see them inclining towards that, then you need to begin investing in that. Investing in that. Bukhari's mother left him in Mecca and went back to Bukhara, went back to, uh, and you can look at the distance between Adrabijan or Uzbekistan and Mecca. Go to the map and look at the distance. She left her child, 16 years old, to seek knowledge in the city of Mecca with the scholars that are there. Very mature decision. Because she saw this kid memorize the Quran, he's sitting in you know, lessons with the scholars. And the last point that I want to make here is something that scholars say, and that is that before you go abroad and start studying abroad, then you should take advantage of the scholars and the people of knowledge in your area. If you notice, before Bukhari made this trip to Mecca and stayed, he began seeking knowledge in the circles of knowledge in the area in the vicinity where he was. You have many students that want to go overseas and study and have never sat in any of the circles of knowledge, even in their own area. The imam of your masjid, the students of knowledge in your area. You should be absorbing knowledge from wherever you can get it from. And then once you feel like you've outgrown, once you feel like you've outgrown this imam or this student of knowledge, you move on to someone who speaks on a higher level. There's a tadaruj, there is a stair step process when it comes to learning and some of us will sit and learn from the same imams and students of knowledge year after year after year te teaching the same things over and over again and you're not growing 
And part of that is fear. I don't want to sit with this person because this person looks like he's off it because they're using language. You know, I get this a lot. You know, people are very apprehensive when it comes to me. I'm not for everybody. I get it. I am not sitting and learning from me. I'm not for everybody, especially when you've been listening to Islam being taught to you in a certain way, using a certain language for such a long period of time. You become accustomed to that. And you become comfortable with that. You become familiar with that. And so you stay right there because it's comfortable. And you reject anything and everything else. Nope. I just listen to these three imams or these four or five imams. And that's all the people I take knowledge from. It's very restrictive. It's very immature to say the least. But you have to begin broadening your circle. So that you can begin absorbing more because how long will it be before you outgrow that particular student of knowledge? And there are many students of knowledge who many of you guys have outgrown. You've heard them so much so that you can listen to the lecture and you can predict what they're going to say, what they're going to say next or where they're going to go next. Because you've heard it a thousand times. You've outgrown them. People start off, come, convert to Islam, and because you're at this, this level, you start going to this masjid, you're listening to this imam, and then one day you come in and you sit and you listen and you're just like, man, this don't even make sense no more. You've outgrown them. Like, man, what is this guy talking about? I went to the masjid last, last, yesterday and the imam was talking and he was talking crazy, man. I don't know. The imam is not talking crazy. He's always talked crazy. You just wasn't wise enough to pick up on it yet. You've now outgrown him so you can hear the flaws in his lectures. And the scholars, they say, if you want to see the flaws in your sheikh, go sit with somebody else. You will never see the flaws in the scholar that you take knowledge from if he's the only person that you take knowledge from. You have nobody to cross-reference the information with. But when you go sit with someone else and then you begin listening and now you're comparing, you're cross-referencing, you're like... You can see all the flaws and the mistakes now. As Imam Shafi said in the line of poetry, that every child is amazed at his father. If you're only listening to your dad, your dad seems like the greatest man in the world. But when you start to listen to uncle and grandpa and other men in your family, you start to see the flaws in your father. Grandpa, my dad told me that one time you did this and you like, yes, your father don't know what he's talking about. That didn't happen like that. It happened like this. Now you start looking at your dad like, well, how many more stories did he give me that was wrong? You know, because now you're cross-referencing stuff that your dad told you with what his father is now telling you. Father's going to sprinkle a little wisdom on it. Dad's going to give you the narrative that he perceived. Grandpa going to give it to you raw. With, with that old head seasoning on it. And it makes sense. And you're like, oh, that's why. Now you can see the flaws in your father. Every child is amazed with his own father. Meaning if you're only taking knowledge from one person all the time, you'll never be able to see the flaws in their teaching strategy, their teaching style, or even the knowledge of the information that they're disseminating. So it's always good to diversify, you know, your paths of knowledge. Even when it comes to listening to non-Muslims. As I said the other day in, in my discussion the other day, you have people who pride themselves on not listening to non-Muslims. And it's just like, do you think all of the knowledge of the world is contained in what comes out of the mouths of Islamic scholars? It's scholarship all around you, whether it's secular or it's religious related, and it's all connected. It's all knowledge. But when you're grounded in the knowledge of Islam, you can filter what you're hearing and what you're reading from people that are not Muslim. You weigh it against what you know from the Quran and the Sunnah. And if it, co if it coincides, then you accept it. If it contradicts it or it goes against it, then you reject it. Or you put it in a place where, as the Prophet ﷺ said about the narrations of Bani Israel, لا تصدقهم ولا تكذبهم You don't deny it and you don't, you know, you don't accept it. You just, you just see it for what it is. You see it for what it is. He said, Hadithu an Bani Israel, narrate the narrations of Bani Israel and don't accept it, don't believe it, and don't reject it either. Because it might be true. So 
At 16 years old, Imam al-Bukhari goes to Mecca. He stays, he seeks knowledge from the Imams and the scholars living during that time. So who were the scholars that were living in Mecca during that time that Imam al-Bukhari began seeking knowledge with? And there is a particular Sheikh that he's going to come across that is going to say something to him that's going to change his entire life. And this is the power of sitting with people of knowledge and you know, people of wisdom and people that are going to give you information that inshallah ta'ala is going to change your life. And it also shows you about you know, the importance of being receptive to things that people are telling you because you never know where your success is gonna come from. Never underestimate the power of the words that somebody is gonna to say to you. It could be one sentence, it could be one direction, it could be one fikra, it could be one thought that someone says to you and it be the cause that changes your entire course. You were going this way and you decided to go in a completely different direction because of some advice that someone gave you. And we're gonna see that with Imam Bukhari, inshallah ta'ala. And we'll stop here, inshallah. Jazakumallah khayran wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa salama taslimin kathira wa subhanaka rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamun ala al-mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Which is Akamalahu Khairan. I don't have